Hi, this is Jason Medore, and in today's video I wanted to go into a little bit more detail and discussion about how I got started collecting, uh, you know, what it means to me, uh, things along those lines. Uh, I'm doing this because a YouTube user asked me to go, uh, you know, thought that it was pretty cool that someone my age uh, collects these and wanted me to go e into even further detail about it. So. I thought I would take this opportunity to do that, uh, you know, and discuss my thoughts and two cents on uh, the topic. So, uh, without further ado, here we go. Um, now, uh, one of the questions that this user asked me was, would you consider yourself more of a record collector or a music collector? Because you mentioned something about digitizing records and then, uh, you know, you, that you prefer actually having the sound file um, on any medium as opposed to having a record itself just for the sake of having it. Um, I, I think that's true. Um, I think my generation especially is more into this. I don't really know any collector past around 40 or 45 that uh, actually, you know, act actively uh, digitizes their collection and uh, makes it so they have more than one copy of a recorded sound file, whether that be on records or tapes or digital, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so I would say that uh, describing myself more as a music collector than strictly a record collector is probably a little bit more truthful. Um, and this is because not only do I regularly listen to new music on the radio and enjoy a lot of it, but also because once you know, once a record is digitized, uh, the resulting sound file can't actually be called an analog recording anymore, because even if the, uh, you know, record that was just digitized was recorded over a century ago, uh, you know, you're still playing back, basically, numbers on a computer. Uh, so the reason that I tend to be more interested in records, though, than other analog formats is because records were the mainstream analog media for gosh, uh, for um, around 90 years, and, uh, you know, things like reel-to-reel -reel releases and tape releases of the same material that was also released on vinyl, um, I've noticed generally tend to be lower in sound quality than the corresponding vinyl release, um, and I've also noticed that those don't tend to age very well either. Um, I've listened to a uh, to a reel-to-reel -reel copy of one of my uh, country albums by Jeannie C. Riley, and the vinyl sounds so much better because uh, there's no dropouts, there's no tape crinkle, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, head misalignment, things like that. Uh, so it, so it's just, it's, it's easier to just collect the vinyl. Um, and, you know, and I would also do a double take on this, that not every record will also have a tape or master copy of it surviving. Uh, and this is especially true for material that was recorded before the uh, advent of hi-fi during the mid-1950s. So uh, material recorded before that could very well not actually have uh, any other uh, release in any other medium besides that uh, issued record. So sometimes records are literally the only surviving copy of a recorded performance that a collector will find anywhere. Uh, and this also brings me to my second topic, that I know many collectors who don't venture out into any other uh, analog formats beyond what they mainly collect. Uh, like, for example, if you look at Tim Fabrizio and Joe Bassard, uh, they don't really collect vinyl or tapes. Uh, they, they're pretty much predominantly strictly 78 RPM record collectors. Uh, now, I would also say people in my age group, though, of course, uh, almost never collect those same records. Uh, because they're only interested in collecting vinyl. And, uh, and I would also add uh, modern vinyl as well, like for today's hits and things like that. Um, and to me, you know, that's, that's kind of a shame because there's so much good music, uh, you know, released after about 1958. Uh, and the significance of that year is because that's when U.S. production of 78s officially stopped. Um, that, you know, I know collectors like Joe Bassard would love, and I know that there are performances recorded before 1958 that uh, today's, you know, millennials would also love. So, I mean, and, and basically where this brings me to is good music is good music. Regardless of when a particular song was recorded, or how it was recorded, or what format it was released on, good music to me is good music. And 
This is because good music does not have an expiration date, and keep in mind that even the oldest record in my collection, uh, which is a Berliner disc from 1896, was once the newest release. I mean, I know it was an incredibly long time ago that that record was released, but at one point it was the newest release. So, uh, so you know, that's that's what I mean. It, you know, good music is good music, and it doesn't matter the format that it's on to me. Not uh, not necessarily. So, sometimes, though, sticking to one format is due to logistics. Like, if, for instance, if you don't have a turntable capable of handling 78 speed or, you know, 16-inch transcription records or something like that, uh, you know, obviously you are going to run into a few roadblocks. And while I'm not saying that this isn't a valid issue, uh, what I am trying to say, though, is that as we get further and further into the digital age here, this is something that, to me, is going to hold less and less water. Uh, so, for example, the audio software that I use can make provision for those who don't have a turntable that has 78 speed on it, so it can digitally manipulate a 78 record that was digitized at 45 RPM. So the resulting digitized sound plays actually at the correct speed that that record was recorded at. Uh, so provided that someone with a two-speed turntable doesn't mind having their 78 collection be an entirely digital one, there's really no reason anymore to avoid collecting different record and analog media formats because, uh, you know, my turntable doesn't have that speed or I can't get 78 styly or something like that. Um, and I think it will be interesting to see if more analog media collectors will start sharing my opinions uh, as time goes on, especially since I'm one of the younger folks who collect them. So lastly, though, that brings me to my final topic here, which is I want to tackle the issue of how best to enjoy these analog recordings. Uh, you know, and believe me, although they can be great to listen to and they have a ton of nostalgic ch charm to them, the thing is, as collectors, we have to be responsible caretakers of them and acknowledge that they are rapidly aging. And as such, we, I am a huge proponent that you need to preserve them digitally to the best possible degree before playing them on original equipment. And I know that this will piss off some collectors who are like, well, you know, having a digital file of it, you know, ruins the, uh, you know, historical authenticity of having the only copy, you know, surviving. And to me, though, that you know, little bit of satisfaction that you have that, you know, you you have the only surviving copy of a record is far outweighed by the possibility that, the, that it can get broken or damaged or chipped or whatever, and there it goes. You're not, you, you know, because you wanted to have that feeling of, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, I... I can, I'll only play this on original equipment and, uh, you know, and be damned if, you know, I don't make a transfer. To me, that's incredibly stupid because it, because now after about 90 years, you know, where the, where these things have, uh, you know, been existing, they're no longer, you know, uh, curiosities. I mean, these are fine antiques and they need to be cared for as such. Uh, you know, I can give you an example as well. Um, you know, recently I came across an extremely rare 78 of Obed Pickard's The Old Gray Horse that appeared to have never been played before. And what I'm trying to say here is I did not immediately try to play it on my Victrola right away. Uh, what, I, what I did was I cleaned it off, I digitized it, and saved the resulting sound file to, the com to my computer and my iPod as a FLAC file, and then I played it on my Victrola. And the and the and that's important because the Victrola uses steel needles and tracks at probably a a good six or seven ounces. Um, I mean, so I'm all for listening to records the way that they were intended to be played, but because they, I will admit that they sound the absolute best. But I also know that these records are not getting any younger, and my Victrola was designed to play them when they were new and much less fragile than they are now. So as an audio enthusiast. As an audio enthusiast, record collector, and you know, music lover combined, I use current technology to preserve them before playing them the same way someone you know, 90, 100 years ago would have. And this also means that I have a second high-quality dub of them when, uh, that I can listen to when I'm in the car, or on vacation, or if, God forbid, the original record gets broken or scratched or chipped or whatever. So. Uh, I hope that this video response clears up some of the uh, questions that this user had. Uh, I certainly enjoy talking about it, but I think I probably have exhausted uh, all that I can say about it. Uh, so if you like this video, be sure to comment, subscribe, and like. 
and uh, and by all means, please do a video response or share it or you know let your opinion be known uh, on this because I'm sure I'm not the only uh, collector my age who uh, you know listens to these old 78s a lot. It's just that finding these same people is a little bit more difficult because it's not something that comes up readily you know in conversation or you know on social media or things like that. So uh, so thanks for watching. This is Jason Medor here and uh, until next time, have a good day. Thanks for watching. Bye.